Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our subject is the cultural consequences of fiat money. It is a subject not very often dealt with in the economic literature. More precisely, I think I'm the only economist who has ever written on the topic. You can find what I've written so far in chapter 13 of my book, The Ethics of Money Production. The chapter is, uh, has the title, The Cultural and Spiritual Consequences of Fiat Inflation. And in chapter, uh, I'm hesitating, I think it's chapter 10 of my book, my German language book, Krise der Inflationskultur, with the title, well, I'll spare you the German language title. But it, will be, it has already been translated into English, and the English edition will appear, hopefully, very soon. Let us start with a few definitions. It's certainly un unusual that an economist would talk about the culture. Usually, we talk about prices and production, quantities that are being produced. We talk about employment, unemployment, the structure of production, the allocation of scarce resources, we talk about entrepreneurship, and then suddenly culture. But you will see very soon that there are certain things that economists can say about the culture, and more precisely, that economists can say about the transformation of the culture. So what is the culture? Of course, many definitions around, but for us it is not necessary to make things very complicated. We can espouse a very large uh, definition uh, by saying that culture, uh, culture is how we do things, is uh, the totality of human action, how we do things, how do we, we eat, for example, how we sleep. There are many different ways how you can eat, you can sit at a table, you can have snacks on your way, uh, different ways of cooking and so on, different ways of preparing food, different ways of sharing food. I just think the family meal, for example, is, is uh, after what I've heard, often non-existent anymore in American culture. So it's, it's a cultural transformation, right? So it's commonly shared fridge, and then everybody serves himself uh, individually. So the family meal is sometimes reserved uh, to a Sunday, and in some families only to great occasions like Christmas and so on. Then everybody gathers, gathers around the table. It was very different 30 years ago, and it's still very different in um, Mediterranean countries in Europe. The way we sleep, uh, the way we move, or we transport, the way we worship, the way we love, the way we produce things, right? how we do things, that's the culture. And of course, uh, the the culture is determined by economic aspects because all human action uh, involves the use of scarce goods, so of economic goods. So there's always some choice involved because in all matters how we do things, there's always uh, some choice and therefore scarcity involved. And therefore economics might have to say something about this. Some economists therefore have started well, uh, analyzing the culture from an economic point of view, most notably um, uh, Deirdre McCloskey. There's a couple of, of books that um, this economist has written about the culture. And one neglected but very important aspect of this uh, inquiry is uh, the culture of in uh, interventionism, or more precisely, the cultural impact of government interventionism. This is a very interesting subject uh, for uh, future research, as an under research, very thoroughly under research topic. So, for those of you who uh, do not have or consider writing a doctoral dissertation in economics and you have not yet found a suitable topic, this is a very interesting uh, topic. Government interventionism has been defined uh, by Ludwig von Mises as a, a single command uh, by virtue of which the government uh, orders uh, the citizens to use their property differently than they would otherwise have done it. So the uh, distinguishing feature of interventionism is that it does not involve the totality of all users, but it's, it's a partial um, socialization of private property. 
Right? So, the, for example, the government tells us, well, you may hire whomever you wish, uh, but you must pay him, if you hire somebody, you must pay him at least the minimum wage. Right? You may engage in contractual relationship, but be sure not to discriminate against anybody. This is a partial discrimination. We are still um, free to engage in this kind of behavior, but we need to respect uh, certain regulations, so we're no longer completely free. This is a partial uh, socialization of our resources. So government interventions do have an impact on the culture, and which can be analyzed by economists. Our subject is the impact of fiat money on the culture. And fiat money is a social institution that comes into existence through government interventionism. Fiat money cannot spring into existence spontaneously. And it needs uh, government support, most notably in the form of uh, legal tender laws or of uh, monopoly privileges. Historically, these were the roots, uh, the roots of uh, fiat money. And our task, therefore, is to analyze how the existence of fiat money changes the culture. I will proceed in two steps. I will first discuss some of the direct consequences of fiat money, and uh, in a second step, discuss some of the indirect consequences, most of, notably those that result from uh, the culture of debt, of the debt economy, uh, which is a fruit of uh, fiat money. So among the direct consequences, we have most notably political centralization and tyrannical government. Oh, these seem to be very stark assertions, um, but they follow directly from the very nature of what fiat money is. Uh, the fact that monetary interventionism involves tyrannical government, or at least paves the way to a tyrannical government, is very old. It goes back to uh, the scholastic Nicholas Oresmi in the uh, 14th century, and has not been stressed uh, much in the 20th century, but one of the economists who uh, stressed it a lot was Ludwig von Mises. And Mises argued as follows. This is a very important argument, and uh, this is certainly something that you should remember and retain from this lecture. Mises argued the following. He said, uh, the economic foundation for the political rule by the people, uh, that is for democratic government, as he called it, is that the government is dependent on the citizens, is financially dependent on the citizens. Uh, the fundamental political problem, as soon as you have something like government, is always how to control those people once they have come into office, by whatever way, uh, by elections, for example. And so, so they show up every four years and sometimes every two years, they stand up for elections, they make a lot of promises. And then once they are in office, they turn around and they very often do different things. Different things from those that they have announced previously, different things from those that you would think that follow quite naturally from their mandate, namely to act in the interest of the common good, in the interest of the people, especially of their constituency. So how do you make sure that these people that act in the interest of the population? It's a very old problem, right? So Plato uh, called this a problem uh, in the translation, right? quis custodiet custodius, who guards the guardsmen. Who watches the night watch, watchman? Okay, it's a, it's a big problem. So Mises says uh, the way we control the government is through the budget. Uh, this is necessary in a, in a free society. If it has government, of course, you can argue well. Um, government in, in the sense of uh, uh, a government that, that chooses the law and that makes the law is never. Uh, an element of a free society. That's a different issue. So Mises did not believe in what we call today anarcho-capitalism. So he believed that there was a, a role for coercive government, for, for uh, social apparatus of violence and coercion. Uh, but he says, so the way we prevent that this gets out of hand is through the budget. So we mandate the government, we elect certain people to government. And uh, it's not necessarily that uh, we elect them on the basis of 
a certain mandate of certain objectives, certain role that they wish to fulfill, we must also uh, decide at the same time the budget, the amount of resources that they may use. <coughs> to give you an example, it would not, not be sufficient to say, well, um, we will have a minimum government that just provides security services. So minimum government, is, we will just provide police forces and we'll have uh, courts uh, and, and an army and we'll just protect private property rights. This by itself, right, so this is a minimum, minimal mission, but the mission by itself does not determine the size of the government. The government may pursue this minimal program with very few resources, let's say one police officer per thousand inhabitants, or with more resources, one police officer per 100 inhabitants, one police officer per 10 inhabitants, or a personal bodyguard for everybody. Right? The policeman may be armed with uh, just a stick, he may, as, as it was the case uh, in, in, uh, in England uh, until very recently. Uh, may be armed with a, uh, with a stick and a gun, he may have a machine gun, he may have a tank, he may have a tank and a fighter jet and so on and so on. I right? just see the point, right? So the mission itself does not by itself determine the amount of resources that are absorbed in the fulfillment of this mission. So it is necessary not only to define the mission, so that's the electoral platform uh, in a, a democracy, but it's also necessary to define at the same time the amount of resources that the government may use. And the population controls the government, makes sure that the government remains the agent of the population by controlling the budget. So if the government wants to extend its activities, it needs to be authorized by the citizens, according to this uh, liberal uh, vision of the political process, needs to be authorized by the citizens in the elections who vote for the party who calls for an increase of taxes, for example. Now, that's, of course, very unpleasant, especially for, for present-day uh, politicians. We might say, yeah, if but this, things had to go this way, then we would never have an increase of government activities. Right? People hate taxes, so we, they would never vote for a tax increase. Uh, quite possibly so, right? but that's precisely the point. Right? That's precisely the point. Right? The government could increase it, its activities only if it's validated, if it's mandated by uh, popular scrutiny, so by the general election. Now, as soon as the government gets around this, right, we deviate from a rule by the people and we move ever more to a rule by the elites that are not endorsed and not supported by the electorate. The first way the government can do this is by just going into debt. That's an easy route. Right? You, you just uh, go into debt, you obtain more uh, money through the financial market. And of course, the resistance there is much weaker, uh, respectively, does not exist at all. If the government, namely, if the government promises not only to restitute the, the money it has loaned out, but also to pay an interest on it. So you have voluntary cooperation with people who finance you and who hope that the government will eventually pay back out of uh, tax proceeds. So it is clear that already here, right, the democratic principle, the control of the government by the people is weakened, right? and the government extends it, it, uh, its activities beyond the scope that would have been possible by taxation alone. Therefore, some uh, social philosophers have always called for uh, the uh, abolition of the possibility of public debt. Uh, Immanuel Kant, most notably, uh, called for uh, the suppression of, of public debt. The government should have no right to, to go into debt. But unfortunately, he uh, called for this only in the specific case of war finance. Of course, that is... Uh, uh, Immanuel Kant could have needed some economics class, right? because if, if you just specify, well, we rule it out for this uh, activity, that's not sufficient, because the government might finance this out of tax proceeds, and then it takes out uh, a loan to finance all other spending that, that similarly goes on. Right? So you cannot limit, uh, rule out uh, government debt uh, this way. Now, of course, fiat money uh, 
allows the government to take out loans to an unlimited extent, right? because fiat money by definition can pre produce without limitation, without commercial limitation, without uh, technological limitation, you can produce as much of it as you wish. And as a consequence, a government that benefits from the support of a central bank, of course a central bank has it in its best interest to support the, the government because itself depends on uh, the legal framework upheld by the government, namely legal tender laws and monopoly privileges. So it, is, it would be ill-advised not to support the government on whom it relies. Right? So as long as the government can rely on, the, on its central bank, which it always can, uh, it can uh, take out virtually any volume of loans, any debt is completely out of proportion with, with its uh, current tax revenues. And that is indeed what we observe and what we have observed in the past 40 years, especially since uh, the abandonment of the Bretton Woods system, so the last link to, to gold. Uh, so we had the establishment of pure fiat currencies. Since then, right, public debt has exploded and has typically also increased not only at a rhythm uh, 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 that was much stronger than uh, the growth of the real economy, but also much stronger than the growth of uh, tax proceeds, uh, so tax revenue for the government. So it is clear then that uh, fiat money allows for an extension of government activities that is completely out of tune with effective public support as demonstrated in elections and as uh, demonstrated by the willingness of the population to uh, vote for tax increases or certain any volume of, of taxes. So what does this mean? It means that to this extent then government becomes tyrannical. It's no longer government by the people, for the people, as you have heard it from Abraham Lincoln, the f famous adage, right? but it becomes government uh, by the elites and for the elites, uh, by the false is no longer really, they're not no longer really elected, right, because they uh, maintain themselves at power and maintain their activities at a level that is not validated by uh, public consent, uh, but by their possibility to access the printing press. So government turns tyrannical. For the same reason, as a second consequence, for the same reason, there is, under a fiat money regime, a tendency toward the centralization of government. Those governments who can benefit from, from a printing press, that's not the only condition that is necessary, but it's an essential condition, have always a competitive edge in comparison to other governments that cannot so rely on this source of financing. This was a very important uh, uh, factor in the political centralization of uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, centralization, for example, within Great Britain uh, around the, uh, the king. And so uh, uh, the king had always a competitive edge in his conflicts uh, with, the, with the local princes and the local dukes and so on. Same thing in Germany, only much later because uh, Germany was politically united, so had a, a common monetary uh, a framework and a common fiat money only much later. Uh, than, than Great Britain. But as soon as it came into being, it gave a political advantage to the central government at the expense of all local governments. Same thing again in the United States. Right? What is the role of states uh, in uh, American politics? Well, it's still, they're still much more powerful than uh, regional governments in Europe, right? but their relative power has greatly diminished in the past hundred years. That's the least thing we can say. And so the main player has become the federal government. Of course, there are juridical aspects to this. Right? There's the uh, commerce clause and, and so on. Uh, but uh, the main, uh, or one of the main factors is that fiat money gives uh, a competitive edge to the uh, federal government in all of its conflicts with uh, state governments. So we have political centralization. A third consequence is, and then there are various related uh, cons direct consequences. So the government, because it can e extend its activities, uh, may engage, for example, in, uh, to a greater extent and for a longer period in its preferred activities, uh, first among which is uh, uh, waging war. Right? So this is much more important in the U.S. than in Europe, 
And so thanks to the printing press, thanks to the unlimited possibilities of financing military adventures, the federal government can engage in wars that are lengthier uh, and more violent, more intensive than it would have been possible if uh, spending would be based exclusively on tax revenue. Uh, as uh, many economists have argued, and most recently Joe Salerno, uh, fiat money regimes were the main factor in extending World War I and World War II. Right. So without fiat money regimes, World War I would probably have been over by 1916, maybe early 1917. At the beginning, there was great enthusiasm in all nations. Everybody was running to the front and said, yeah, we'll beat the frogs, said the Germans. And, and the, the French said, yeah, we'll beat the Bosch. That's how they call them, right? So we'll beat the Bosch. And uh, so they were in the war frenzy. It was often the case uh, when you did not have a major war for long, many long years, which is not the case of the United States. Right? But it, it was the case of Germany at the time, it was the case of France at the time, so they were really rushing through the front, it was a war frenzy. So they would have agreed to pay higher taxes, uh, have lower net revenues for themselves for a certain while. But then your cousin dies, your son dies, your brother dies, if you yourself die, well, uh, but if you survive, I mean, you, you, you very soon you uh, become tired of the war. It's just a very nasty business. And plus, I mean, they got stuck at the front. It was not the, the kind of war that they had imagined where they gloriously just run over the other country. I mean, they really got stuck. And then all the, the killing took place and it, nothing moved and it was just killing and killing and cost and cost. You grow tired of this very, very soon. So if this had to be financed out of tax revenue, the war would have been over very fast. It was not over very fast because there was a printing press. So the government could go on and suck ever more resources indirectly out of the economy to finance the war effort. And this was especially terrible if we consider that most of the killing occurred in the last years of the war and especially in the last months. And so many, many millions of people could have survived uh, had it not been for the printing press. Same thing in World War II. Another uh, pet scheme of, of governments that hitherto has been more important in Europe than in the United States, uh, but is becoming now more important in the United States as well, is the welfare state. Uh, so clearly without fiat money and the possibility of financing government activities, the welfare state would not go very far. Uh, it would exist, but it would be rather limited uh, because few people would uh, be ready to pay much higher taxes uh, to finance welfare handouts, which is only one thing, but especially the, the uh, apparatus, the bureaucratic apparatus that is the intermediary of those handouts, right? So few people would be willing to finance the welfare industry. And another uh, direct consequence, more or less direct consequence, uh, of uh, fiat money is, of course, a tendency for the price level to be higher than it otherwise would have been. And this means, uh, in practice, that the price level becomes permanently, uh, that we permanently have positive inflation rates. Okay, it's a direct consequence of a fiat money regime. In a pure market economy, which we only had natural monies like gold and silver, there would be a natural tendency for the price level to diminish. We would have what is called uh, deflationary growth because the money supply, money production tends to lag uh, in, in an in economy based on very strong capital accumulation and technological progress. It tends to lag behind the growth rates of the real uh, uh, economy, this, of, of the production of goods and services. Therefore, there prevails a tendency for prices to drop. This is what we had until uh, World War I, by and large, in all European countries. Uh, so you can look at the, the standard uh, uh, textbooks and economic history in the 19th century, and you will find that while well, the price level diminishes in Great Britain, by and large, throughout all the 19th century, it diminishes in France, uh, by and large, throughout 
all of the 19th century. So, I mean, with the exception of the Napoleonic Wars, right? So let's say from 1815 to 1914, by and large, there, there is no such thing as inflationary growth, that is, a growing economy in the context of an environment in which prices rise, in which the price level rises. Virtually never happens. What you do have is growth with either with a stable price level or with a shrinking price level. Same thing in Germany, same thing in the United States. Some of the, I believe that the highest growth rates in American history uh, were realized, so you had Chinese growth rates, right, in the uh, last third of the 19th century, and most of this was deflationary growth. Uh, so this is a natural element of a free economy. Fiat money allows the government, of course, to, to create more money than would otherwise have been created. So the price level is always higher. It does not mean that it becomes positive. Might, the deflation might just be lower than it otherwise would have been. And so rather uh, than having uh, uh, the price level diminish 5%, it only diminishes 2%. That's possi possible. But in actual practice, uh, the production of fiat money is always pushed to the point where it creates positive inflation rates. And this is no accident, it's actually something that has been uh, wished for by monetary authorities out of considerations that we would call Keynesian, okay, which are much older than uh, Keynesian economics as, uh, that we know from the 1930s. Uh, this is a very old idea that the more money you spend, the better it is for the economy. And it is a very old idea that it should be uh, an objective of monetary policy to discourage the hoarding of money. Uh, so people are likely to hoard money if the price level shrinks. If the price level shrinks by 5% per year, then you can earn a return on of 5% on your savings by just holding money, by just holding gold coins or silver coins in your pocket. So there's a strong incentive to build up savings in the form of cash holding. So according to very old ideas, this, this would be very, very bad. Right? This is the vampire economy. You suck the blood out of the economy and oh, you paralyze everything. Right? So therefore, we should discourage this. And money cranks of the 19th century, they, they've argued, well, we should create money of a sort that the price level always rises. Or maybe we should start clipping money. Right? So pay a tax on banknotes. So every, every month or so, uh, the, the, the value of the banknote is being reduced so that people have an incentive to spend it as fast as possible. The clipping was somewhat technically difficult to realize. It's difficult also to sell a banknote to anybody if he has he knows that it will be clipped at the end of the, the month or something like this. Right. So the, the best way technically to do this was to create so much money, fiat money, that the price level would always rise positively and which represents some sort of a taxation on the purchasing power of money. Right. So a price level rises 2% every year or 3% every year, then it is as if somebody had clipped 2 or 3% out of your coin every year. So you have an incentive not to save in the form of cash, but to spend it sooner rather than later. So that was not an accident. Uh, it was an, it, the result of uh, planned intervention in the, in the economy. Now, something happened that was only anticipated by a few people, but was also anticipated at least by some people, and, and uh, so willed, <laughs> namely, an encouragement of the credit market, that is, of uh, a tendency toward the debt economy. All throughout the 20th century, there's a tendency for the credit market to grow. Governments, firms, and households started taking out more and more loans. Uh, credit for households was virtually unknown before the 20th century. Right? Only very poor households needed loans. Uh, regular households that could live off uh, of the yearly income, so never had any loans, never had any debt. That was also a cultural fact, right? so prevalence of Christian views on, on a just uh, economy and orderly conduct and so on, created these results. Firms were eventually, were, were essentially 
uh, financed out of uh, equity. Uh, so the owner's capital that was being used, there was virtually no credit to, to firms. Maybe a little commercial credit right in your relationships with uh, customers and with suppliers. Uh, so you supply uh, merchandise and you're being paid two months uh, thereafter. So credit existed to that extent, but not to finance any uh, fixed investment or so on. Governments, of course, had always credit. Right? All governments were always into, in, into debt since time immemorial. So if you have a fiat money system, which allows us to create a positive uh, price inflation, then, of course, there exist very strong incentives to go into debt for all sectors. Let us first consider a household, because this is the experience that is universally shared by all of us. And some of you guys are, are young, so you don't have yet uh, revenue, you're still in school and so on, but I promise one of the first things that you will do once you get out of school is to take out a, a loan, take out a mortgage, and to buy an apartment or a house. Uh, have you ever wondered why, why you do this? And why you do not first accumulate money and then buy the house? Well, I've already given you the answer implicitly. Well, you, today would make no more sense to just accumulate, to stack cash for, let's say, 10 years and then buy the house. I mean, you would lose a lot of money in those 10 years. Right. And that's why we buy first the house. And then, and then we can actually eventually even profit from this uh, credit. Right. And so you take a loan... Uh, as high as you can serve with your service with your present income. Uh, let's say you have an uh, annual income the first year after you get out of college of $50,000, and you take out a loan uh, on which you pay, let's say, $15,000 uh, per year, or let's say $12,000 per year, $1,000 per month, right? and which uh, would be uh, in the order of, whatever, $200,000. And then you buy a nice house, a nice apartment, or something like this. Now, what happens in an inflationary economy is that eventually your revenue will increase. Of course, it also increases because you become ever smarter, you become more experienced, right? And so on. For this reason, too, the value of your, your work increases. But let's say if you stay even as dumb as you are now. <laughs> as all prices progress, so will your revenue. More money will be used within the economy, so companies will compete for the existing factors of production, among which is your labor force, by spending more and more money. So your revenue will increase. Now that means that if you get into debt at a fixed interest rate, that servicing this debt will become ever lighter, a light, an ever lighter burden on your, on your budget. So as you go along, right, the first five years or so are difficult, and uh, at 10 years, it's much easier than the first five years. At 20 years, right, your, your revenue is almost doubled right, in, in monetary terms, and your debt is still, or the debt service is at the level as it was in the first year. So it's a great advantage right, to go into debt and to pay present expenditure by, by debt rather than by first ac accumulating savings. That's why we do it. Okay. Now, the same incentive exists for firms. It exists, in fact, for all market participants. Right? A firm has a strong incentive to finance uh, fixed investment machines, uh, real estate, and so on that it needs, equipment with a credit. And if this is a long-term investment, right, so uh, for 10 years or 20 years or, or whatever, because it can expect that its revenue, if it stays in business, right, it can expect its revenues to increase under the impact of the general price inflation. So what is burdensome at first becomes ever lighter subsequently. And the same incentive finally also exists for governments, right? because governments, due to the progression of prices, can expect an increase of tax revenue in the future. So they too have an incentive to go into debt even if they did not have this wish in the first place, which, of course, they usually have. So a fiat money system, therefore, we might say, creates a generalized rush into leverage. Right? Less and less spending is financed out of equity, out of your own money, and more and more is financed out of the credit market. Now, you might say, where does this money on the credit market come from? 
everybody has an interest to take out loans, but who provides the loans? Well, in a fiat money system, people have a very strong incentive also to invest in uh, credit market-related financial instruments. Because how do you save? Right? It's no longer worthwhile to keep your money in cash, because then you lose. So you need to choose forms of savings that will compensate you for the loss of purchasing power of the money unit. So you need to buy something that increases in monetary value with the general price inflation, such as real estate, such as stocks, uh, so shares in companies, or you need to buy something that maybe that, that nominally stays at the same value but is linked to a, a revenue that compensates you for the loss in purchasing power. And that is uh, typically the case with credit market instruments. Right? So you buy a life insurance. You put money on a savings account. Right? So the bank promises you, well, we'll pay you 1.5%. That's great. Uh, of course, 1.5% today is less than the price inflation rate, so you still lose. But you lose less than you would have lost if you had kept your money in cash. So in a fiat money system in which the central bank creates a positive price inflation rate, both the demand for credit increases and the supply of credits also increases. And it's a huge boon for the credit market. And of course, it is therefore also a huge boon for financial intermediaries, such as banks, commercial banks, and insurance companies, and also investment funds. That is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why financial markets had such a f spectacular growth spurt in the past 100 years. There's a well-known fact uh, among historians that was uh, first firmly established at the end of the 1960s uh, by a British uh, statistician of the name of uh, Raymond Goldsmith. Right. So Goldsmith had a look at well, all major uh, Western countries, and he found that, well, I mean, the uh, financial markets grow more rapidly than the real economy. It's amazing. So how does this come? Right. And this tendency has actually increased in the past 40 years. Uh, the growth of the financial sector is much more rapid than the growth of the real economy. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is, of course, a cultural feature of our time. And, uh, lots of well-paid people on Wall Street and so on, all the bonuses and so on, uh, that make the news and the envy of the other citizens sometimes. Uh, but it's the direct consequence of a fiat money system. Now, there are other cultural features directly related to this debt economy and to this financialized economy. I will highlight four of them here. I've discussed others uh, in my book, uh, four things that can be relatively easily explained. The first consequence is um, a tendency to encourage in our decision-making a short-term perspective or in other words, a certain haste. We need to hurry up to take out credits as soon as possible. We need to hurry up to, to, uh, to gain revenue as soon as possible. Uh, you need constantly to have revenue uh, because you cannot sit on your, on your savings. The savings lose their value uh, if you just hold them in cash. So you need to have constantly revenue. You need to take out loans as quickly as possible so that the burden then becomes lighter uh, relatively soon. Right? This is, of course, something that characterizes financial markets as an extreme short-term orientation. Most uh, uh, of, of the money managers that we call investors, uh, which are uh, really just paid intermediaries, have an extremely short-term orientation, uh, which results from this. But it's, it would be bad just to pinpoint uh, the evil guys on Wall Street and so on if, if you consider carefully your your own behavior, and I do this with my own behavior as well, and compare this to what you've seen in your grandparents and what you've learned about people living in the 19th century, you'll see that we are moving at an incredible speed. Of course, you can look at this positively and say, yes, I mean, we are so much faster today, and, 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 and so on and so on. But the, the, this haste, this, uh, this lacking calm, lacking serenity, and so on, results to some extent from the fact that there are very strong material rewards right, that are associated with getting into debt soon and then making sure you can always uh, bring in uh, revenue to service the debt. 
So there are two uh, related consequences that immediately spring from it. One is uh, increasing materialism. So we become in a fiat money system out of self-interest more materialistic than we would have been under a natural monetary system. We need to watch our investments. We cannot just sit on cash. We need to watch our investments constantly. Uh, even if you're a dentist or you're, you're a carpenter and so on, you need to know something about uh, the stock market because, or your insurance market or something because part of your savings are invested with these guys. In a natural monetary order, you could just sit on cash. Well, you could be robbed, not be riskless, but uh, right, you wouldn't have to worry about other people. Uh, now suddenly you have to worry about other people, become materialistic, especially also since it is so much more difficult to recover from a loss of uh, uh, of wealth. Uh, once you've lost, it's very difficult to to catch up. Another uh, related um, cultural consequence is <coughs> insatiability. I need, again, to start first with a mon natural monetary system and then compare our behavior under a fiat money system. Under a natural monetary system, investments that we make uh, underlie well, uh, decreasing returns. And we can ac accumulate ever more capital, but we cannot invest that capital, these savings, we cannot invest them always at the same returns as before. Right? We're constantly, by increasing our savings, we're constantly increasing the supply on the capital market, now capital market in the Austrian sense. Right? And as a consequence, the return, that the, the earnings that you can derive from such investments invariably uh, diminish. Okay. So that means then that in a, in a free society, uh, there are uh, there, there's an inbuilt break in the accumulation of capital and especially in the investment of capital in order to earn revenue out of it. At some point, the, the returns become so low that this is no longer an incentive uh, for savings. So the savings that then occur have other purposes, right? They, they finance our personal projects, which are not associated with a monetary return. They finance philanthropic ac activities, church activities, and so on, which are not associated with a uh, monetary return. Okay. So that's the natural tendency in a free society. And this is, if you look at what happened in the 19th century, especially in the U.S., that's exactly what happened. Things change under a fiat money system. Because under a fiat money system, you can always increase the return on your own money by leveraging your investment. And this is called the leverage effect. And it's difficult to explain this in a, in a few sentences for, for the non-experts, but so you look this up right on, on, the, on the internet. Maybe to give you one example. Let's say you have an investment in a firm uh, that requires 100 units of money, $100,000. I say 100 units of money, and it gives you a return of 10%. Let's say you produce uh, pens. And by producing the pens, you earn 10% return. Now, if you finance this, all of this with your own money, then what you will earn is 10%. But you might, if you can obtain a credit at a lower interest rate than the return that you earn by producing pens, for example, you can, if you can obtain a uh, credit at 5% from a bank, right, then you can leverage the return on your own investment. If you finance 90 units of your investment with a loan of 5% and only 10 units with your own money, then what will be the return on your own money? Well, okay, you still earn 10 units of money through the investment, right? and now out of this uh, revenue, you have to pay your creditor. Right? So you pay him 5% on 90 units of money, so 4.5 units of money. Right? So your, your net revenue is no longer 10 units of money, it's uh, 10 minus 4.5, so 5.5. Now these 5.5 is the return on your personal investment of 10. You have invested only 10 units of money of your own money, and you earned 5.5. Now how much of a return is this in percent? 
It's not 5.5. 55. It's 55. Right? You've invested 10 and you earn 5.5. It's 55% return. Okay? That's the leverage effect. The leverage effect results when you can take out loans at a lower rate than the rate that you realize, that the yield that you realize through your investment. Right? It's a risky undertaking. Okay. But that's the thing you can do. So you see, in a fiat money system, which the credit market develops so well, right, as we've seen, there are very strong incentives for people to rush into leverage. And so they can always, by going into more leverage, become, if they become more daring, or if they are sufficiently daring, there can always, always a possibility for them to increase the return on their investment. So the saturation point that would obtain in a natural economy no longer exists. If only you are sufficiently risk friendly okay and there's another uh, related aspect to this namely that of course um, going into debt taking out additional loans is easier if you are already very rich because if you're already very rich you own houses and, and apartments and so on then you can offer this as a collateral right as a security to back up the loan it's not possible for people who are not yet rich so the perverse consequence then in a fiat money system is that the richer, the richer you are, the stronger is your incentive to keep, to remain fully invested. On a natural monetary system, rich persons at some point will say, okay, the return on my investment diminishes on and on and on. There's no more point. Uh, it becomes pointless to, to seek other investments. Well, now I will just become more philanthropic. In our system, this is reversed. The richer you are, the greater are the incentives to remain fully invested and to neglect philanthropic act uh, activities, except to the extent that it's necessary to keep a good public image <laughs> right, uh, with the rest of the citizens so that they do not torpedo your activities through the political process. Uh, so genuine philanthropy disappears and is being replaced by fake philanthropy and which, in any case, is at a lower level than it would be in a natural uh, economic order. A third uh, major consequence is uh, increased depend uh, dependence on other persons. Right? Again, if your savings are in cash, you do not depend on anybody. You have gold coins or silver coins in a hole dig into your garden or under your pillow, okay, they can be taken away, they can be robbed, so it's not riskless, but their value does not depend on what other persons do. It's different if you give a credit to somebody or if you buy a share in the company, then you become dependent on the good behavior of those other persons, on their faithful accomplishment of their, of their mission. A good friend of mine in, in, in France uh, he's now a professor emeritus. He always stressed that this is, was wonderful because uh, it created greater social interdependence. We care more for others and so on. And so he says, uh, there was a positive side to this process. And, well, I have difficulties finding much joy myself by considering this, right? Because, again, it is not a genuine interest for others. It's a very interested, selfish uh, concern that we have for others. We have become interested in what others do because their behavior will have negative re repercussions on us. Not because we are genuinely interested in that person, because we love this person and we want that it, well, develops according to the best of his abilities. We become selfish in our concern for others. And what we have here is not a genuine integration, a voluntary integration, but what Wilhelm Röpke once called a forced integration. <laughs> It's not, right? Integration is not always, an increase of the division of labor is not always beneficial, both from, from an economic point of view and from a political point of view, can also be forced, right? So they can be excessive. And that is certainly something that results uh, necessarily in a fiat money system. And a related aspect of this is the increasing politicization of society. Right? Because we have increasing more concerns for others in a, in a debt-ridden economy, a debt-ridden economy is fragile. Right? If one 
Uh, we, we know this uh, uh, in, in, because in present-day financial jargon, there's the concept of um, a bank that is too big to fail, TBTF. Uh, so big, too big to fail market participant. If this bank, uh, let's say, if Goldman Sachs uh, goes bankrupt, well, then the entire financial market will melt down. Uh, because if uh, Goldman Sachs is no longer able to pay back its loans, its, its credits, Right, then that, this means that other people, other market participants who have loaned to, finan uh, to Goldman Sachs will see their assets melt in the sun. So they will not be able to, to pay back their creditors and so on. Right? So you get a chain reaction. So the stronger is the level of debt in any economy, the stronger is therefore the selfish concern for the others. And the stronger is our incentive to try through the political process to control the behavior of others. So fiat money creates a tendency toward the politicization of society. A fourth and last uh, consequence that I should like to uh, point out is uh, what uh, my German colleague uh, Thorsten Polite has called um, collective corruption. So he has an article out on the subject in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, uh, I think of 2012. Very good article. I recommend all of you to, to, to read this. So what he points out is that in a fiat money system, um, no individual market participant, no household, no firm, uh, certainly not the government, has an interest in abolishing the system or in discouraging the foundations of the system. Nobody has an interest to abolish the fiat money system and uh, uh, put in its place uh, a gold standard, a silver standard, or currency competition, anything that would limit the amount of money that can be produced. Because as soon as this happens, uh, you get a collapse uh, of the financial industries, and in any case, right, credit becomes much less readily available. It would be necessary to completely change the way we do things, that is to change our culture. We could no longer rely that much on debt. We would have to rely more on our own means. We'd have to save first, right? lead a frugal life, and then eventually uh, pay our way out of our sa own savings. Right. So nobody, in, even though one might consider, yeah, the, the, the overall consequences, both economic and cultural, are terrible of the system, right. it is in nobody's material interest in the short run to abolish the system. Because everybody stands to lose in the short run. So even though uh, we might, if, especially if we learn a little bit of Austrian economics, we, we see right the, the perverse uh, working of the system from an overall point of view, from our own short run materiali materialistic uh, interest, it is in our, uh, we, we wish to keep it up, we wish not to abolish it. That's collective corruption. Okay. In uh, e economic theory, it is called a rationality trap. Right? It's, a, it's a difference between um, well, an overall point of view and an individual point of view. And a rationality trap is the typical consequence of government interventionism. You see this in many places. You see, here's a very dramatic example, but you see it also elsewhere. For example, uh, higher education. Right? So government subsidizes higher education, so higher education comes at a lower cost than it would be on the, on the market, it allows you individually to gain a competitive edge as compared to all the other evil guys who want to have the same jobs that you aim for. Right? So you, you're interested in doing this, but of course, if everybody right, t takes out the, the, these diplomas, their value is diminished. Right? So the, the same types of activities that in former times were uh, being pursued by, by uh, employees without a university diploma, without uh, well, no graduates or, or just had barely a high school diploma, are today being carried out by people with master's degrees and PhDs. Right? It's another typical example of a rationality trap. Right? It's in each, each one's individual interest to maintain the system, maintain easy access to higher education. But from an overall point of view, it's probably an enormous waste of resources, uh, both time and material resources. So rationality traps, co uh, collective corruption, a typical consequence of government interventionism. That makes, by the way, for, uh, for uh, it's, it's a nice subject if you want to analyze this in different areas, how government intervention creates rationality traps. 
And it's a nice area for uh, papers, term papers that you write, or maybe a master's thesis or something like this. In conclusion, then, so I've uh, demonstrated that we can apply economic analysis to explain cultural transformations, and that a particularly important example is the case of fiat money. Uh, fiat money has a very profound impact on our culture, and it's difficult to see it unless you step back and you consider the evolution of a long time. If you just consider economic history of the past 10 years, it would escape your notice, because you are yourself part of that culture. Um, so you're only being awestruck if you compare it to previous times and then wonder what explains these changes in our behavior, this, this change in the way how we do things as compared to how they were being handled by our ancestors. Of course, there are many other factors that also come into play, but fiat money is a major source. And probably, right, this, this phenomenon of collective uh, corruption explains why it is so difficult right, to, um, to change the monetary system and to change also the political system. Right, because everybody stands to lose in the short run, not only materially, but also because such a change would defy, would challenge, would overthrow our traditional way of life to which we have become accustomed. Right? We, are, we are culturally unfit in a way uh, for uh, a natural economy. <coughs> but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't dare to bring it about. Right? It's ultimately, it's a question of courage and of insight uh, and of the will. The will can change under the impact of, of prudence and of insight. And I hope that I've provided today one little element to encourage you in this way. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>